Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, today, we continue the Dharma and Justice dialogue series from the Thich Nhat Hanh Program for Engaged Buddhism. My name is Peace Twesigi, and I am the program manager for this program, as well as Buddhism and interreligious engagement, um, where students are pursuing master's degrees here all within Union Theological Seminary in, in New York City. So this evening, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School and Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology here at Union will be in conversation with Dr. Pamela Ayo Yatunde, um, exploring Buddhist and Christian womanist theology as it relates to today's social realities. Womanist theology re-examines a religion's practices, rituals, scriptural canon, and its interpretation with a moral perspective that empowers and liberates Black women, their communities, and arguably all in the wake of such a radical shift. Such questions that might be explored this evening are how do Buddhist and Christian womanist liberation theologies relate to one another? Um, in our movements to support the liberations of the liberation of all through a womanist lens, how are we perhaps seeing things differently in important ways? So let me tell you a little bit about the two people who will be in conversation this evening. Uh, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas is Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School and Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology here at Union Theological Seminary and also serves as the canon theologian at the Washington National Cathedral and theologian in residence at Trinity Church Wall Street. Some of Douglas's books include Sexuality in the Black Church, A Womanist Perspective, that was written in 1999, uh, Black Bodies in the Black Church, A Blues Slant in 2012, and Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, written in 2015. In addition, uh, Dean Douglas is the co-editor of Sexuality and the Sacred, Sources for Theological Reflection, which was written in 2010. She has been a pioneering and highly sought after voice in, uh, in regard to addressing sexual issues in relation to the Black religious community. And she has been very active in advocating for equal rights for LGBTQ persons. And Dr. Pamela Ayo Yatinde is the co-editor of Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resilience and Transformation and Freedom that was released at the end of 2020. She's also written Buddhist Christian Dialogue, U.S. Law and Womanist Theology for Transgender Spiritual Care, also in 2020. And <laughs> Object Relations, Buddhism and Relationality in Womanist practic Practical Theology. She is the co-founder of Center of the Heart and founder of Audrey Spiritual Care for Women with Cancer. Ayo also works as a pastoral counselor and chaplain. We're really happy to have you here, Ayo. Um, I would also like to say a quick thank you to Ian Reese, who is working hard behind the scenes to help this event run smoothly, and also to Pam and Travis, the ASL interpreters here tonight, allowing for a more accessible event. And just before we get started, I want to note that uh, the, for those of you in the webinar here, the Q&A box is open. So feel free to drop in questions in the Q&A box that come up during the conversation this evening. Um, they easily get lost in the chat. So if you want the questions to be addressed by our two speakers this evening, please put them in the Q&A box. And for those of you streaming, Ian will do his best to bring in questions from Facebook and YouTube as well. And there will be time reserved at the end to respond to questions that you might have. 
So again, welcome everyone. And now I'd like to hand it over to Dean Douglas and Dr. Ayo Yatunde. Thank you, Peace. So uh, uh, Kelly and I ne negotiated <laughs> who would start and who would finish. So I, I guess I wanna start, I have so much on my mind. First of all, I guess I wanna express gratitude to the Thich Nhat Hanh program for inviting me to be a part of this conversation with you. Uh, I have a lot of respect for you, Kelly. I've got your books right here. I've quoted you in my dissertations, you know. Um, so this is real, a real honor for me. And um, yeah, so. Well, I, I'm humbled by that. And I'm honored to be in this conversation with you. I've read your stuff and I know your work. And so I am grateful. Uh, for peace and the Thich Nhat Hanh, uh to bring us together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because you know what? We, we have so much work to do. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, wow. You know, and I've never said it with so much joy. <laughs> and I think the, re the reason why is because um, I know, uh, I feel confident that I have a partner in you. Now, you don't know why yet, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why because you and I think alike. <laughs> um, we have the same concerns for black people, for justice, for um, advocating for the oppressed, including LGBTQ people, for teaching, for spiritual leadership. Um, and we have those, and writing. Of course, I don't write like, I mean, you're, you're prolific, okay? I can't keep up. Orvis uh, should be <laughs> so proud of you. Um, but we have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. And because of those things, I think th there are things we can do together. So I wanna start with the fact that I decided to read Exodus. Mm. The last time I tried to read Exodus, I was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And I was searching for answers. I was uh, facing the last year of college and being pulled be uh, somewhere between doing the right thing and doing the thing that was gonna make me a lot of money. Right. I'll put it that way. So I decided to read the Bible for myself. I grew mm -hmm. up in the United Methodist Church. I'm gonna read the Bible for myself and the answers will be revealed. Hmm. By the time I got to the book of Exodus, I had to close, I had to close it because I said, this is the violence yeah. The violence, I can't, I can't take it. These are not the answers I'm looking for. Yep. <laughs> I, I will trust that the answers are in the Bible, but I can't read, I can't take it in. So with that in mind, having just sat with reading it, reading it contemplatively, trying to uh, feel my way through the characters and so on. And given that we both have referenced Exodus, uh, and the importance of the Exodus story for black people. My question to you is, do you still think it should hold the place that it does for the next steps in our, in our liberation path? My goodness, Ayo, you're supposed to be nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a Buddhist practitioner, of course. But a good, but, but a good question. First, though, let me say uh, that I do think that uh, this is the beginning for us of work that we'll do together. And because I really appreciate uh, and am humbled uh, by you speaking of the things that we hold in common. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think that as long as you know, we hold in common this passion for a more just world where everyone can flourish into the beings that they were meant to be and created to be. And, you know, and I know you have that passion and that spirit from your work, from uh, your writing, et cetera. And so I am excited as you are for the work we have ahead of us. 
to do together. And I don't find the work that we have ahead of us in terms of trying to create a more just world, I don't find that daunting. I find that challenging and an opportunity. But now to your easy question <laughs> <laughs> about the exodus. But it's a good question because you're right. First, let me begin by saying that that which while the exodus story uh, is and has been central to uh, the black faith tradition, so as I'll talk about in a minute, that's not what really uh, opened up my own sort of uh, Christian imagination and which brought me to sort of uh, really affirmation of, of being Christian. Uh, because really for me, and, and I've told this sort of story in other places, uh, I loved the church, uh, obviously I'm Episcopalian, and, uh, and it were it was stories of Jesus and the story that really bought me, there was not actually the crucifixion, it was the story, the myth of Jesus being born in a manger. And I remember that I used to cry every time we would sing that song, little, uh, 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 what is that song? Uh, Baby Jesus Born in Manger. Now I can't, I can't think yeah. of, it, but, uh, I can't think of the uh, lyrics, but, uh, or the tune, but that he was born in a manger mm -hmm. because I always identified his reality of being born in a manger with uh, those children who were uh, trapped in manger-like realities, even from when I was a kid. So the Exodus story didn't really have any significance to my own sort of faith formation uh, until I got older. And until we began to, I began to listen to the songs and the spirituals that we sang and to understand how significant the Exodus story was to the uh, Black faith tradition and to the Black faith story. And the sto one of the stories be besides Jesus on the cross that bought the, the captive African and the enslaved uh, African into Christianity. So let me say, it's, make this brief. That which really captured their imagination uh, was the fact that they began to see this God of the Exodus that heard the pleas of the Israelites, they began to see that, wait a minute, that God isn't like the God that their enslavers were telling them about, right? This was the God that they recognized the, because I always say, even though their enslavers may have introduced them to Christianity, they didn't introduce them to God. And so this God sounded like the God, their great high God who created them in freedom, uh, to knew them in freedom and affirmed who they were as free beings. So that's what drew them. To, to this Exodus tradition, to this Exodus God. This was a God of freedom. This was a God that uh, affirmed uh, that they were free and that acted against anything that would suggest that they weren't. So that was the story initially <laughs> that as I was introduced to sort of the centrality of that story as I grew in my own black faith, that's what uh, was significant for me, but you're right that we can't just stick with the Exodus event because, you know, the that sort of God calling them into freedom because God also called them, right, into a land, uh, pre presumably God called them into a land that was inhabited. And that, and, and, and and didn't call them to respect the people of that land that was promised them a land that was inhabited. That that sounds sort of like manifest destiny. That sounds like what happened uh, to indigenous peoples in this country, and was the excuse that some uh, that white Christians gave for exterminating uh, the indigenous peoples. So it's problematic, and so I say this to answer your question in brief that. 
certain story, one, we have to broaden our understanding of the Exodus story. And so to understand that it also became a story that oppressed uh, and that we have to uh, begin to uh, question that story and it can't hold, and I do agree, I think it can no longer hold the kind of uh, sort of sacred authority that it is held in uh, the black faith uh, tradition without there being further interrogation, without there being other stories. And I think the thing that the black faith tradition, at least black theological tradition uh, has lost is the prophetic voices that began to question. The prophets emerged from the people, right, who were given the quote unquote promised land and began to question those people who were beginning to act like those who had oppressed them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that we can't just simply take over the, the uh, Exodus story uh, without questioning it and without bringing into account the prophetic voices that begins to hold us accountable to living into the freedom to which God calls all humanity. And anytime we begin to act in such a way that stifles that freedom, then uh, it becomes problematic in our relationship, uh, not only to God, but in relationship to who we are called to be. Mm -hmm. But see, but now I wanna see, so now I wanna. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Turn, but, but, turn around, fair play. But, yeah, but see, yeah. But one, I want to want to, you know, sort of uh, ask you as as you ask me that question. What one, mm -hmm. what what sort of leads to that? And then I have been fascinated uh, by uh, one of your articles where you talk about uh, Siddhartha. And uh, uh, and you begin to talk about sort of the five or so principles of, of, of Buddhism. And I was, what struck me, because I think it's so, and you said it, you so said it so critically uh, well, that when we are called, you know, Siddhartha's recognition of suffering, right? Uh, uh, and how uh, people suffer and suffering and, and become sort of this uh, thing that connects one, us to our humanity. But how do you do that? When we're, that we're talking about what, what we recognize in the myth of, in the te a legend of Siddhartha is that he's talking about the suffering that everyone experiences just because we're human beings and mortal. But what, what, is, what becomes of the critique of the suffering that people experience, not simply because of their mortality, mm -hmm. but because of who they are, the, the, the social, uh, uh, historical suffering that is racism, that is uh, uh, sexism, that is what I like to call LGBTQ uh, Q terrorism. What about, mm -hmm. how does Buddhism in, engage that suffering? Mm -hmm. Oh, so you, so I see how you operate. <laughs> I ask you one little question and then you come back with two big questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's good. That's good. I, um, let me, Kelly, let me tell you why I asked you the question about Exodus, you know, recognizing, you know, having read that section in Stand Your Ground in your book, Stand Your Ground on um, Exodus, it just, it just reminded me that, oh yes, I had also briefly mentioned this, uh, the centrality of Exodus for how we identify ourselves as African descended people on the path to freedom. Yep. But, you know, arguably, arguably, we've been free for a long time. And so if we keep going back to stories of our enslavement and identifying with that enslavement, and then God bringing us out of enslavement. You know, do we, do we somehow miss the strength that comes out of having been free all these years? Like what's the material of our freedom relative to being enslaved? 
that can take us into the next phase, which I think is uh, part of your work. Trayvon Martin being killed in 2012, George Floyd being killed in 2020, and those in between and those who will be killed next. Your argument in your book is that we need to change the law. We need to change laws. So can the Exodus story help help animate us to be the prophetic voices for uh, legal reform? Or do we need something else that's gonna me, help us do that? Let me just quickly say this and then, because this also connects to this thing of, of suffering. And, yeah. and, and that is a see, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm I, I'm going to have to push back a little bit on this fact of, 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 you know, that we were, we've no longer an enslaved people were free and, and the, what the Exodus story is telling us, because I think that what the Exodus story is telling us is a story of a struggle to be free. And that when we began to understand that, and, and this becomes a problematic, even in the story itself, when the, Israelites began to understand we're free and 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 then they began to act as if uh, their freedom was simply being freed from the bondage of uh, the Egyptians as opposed to their being freed from that bondage to live into what it means to be free even as they struggle toward the freedom that God calls us all into. And the moment that freedom becomes this sort of static uh, reality of being freed from one situation of bondage uh, and, and not recognizing that it is about more than that and that freedom, this is what I like about womanism, that they, it talks about not being, not a struggle for survival and freedom, a struggle for, for survival and wholeness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's what God calls us into. Mm -hmm. In the moment, it was just this notion that, oh, we're no longer uh, enslaved by the Egyptians and we're free free to do what? And so you're free to live into this covenant of freedom that God has called us into. So it's always dynamic. And we know if we look, if, 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 when we talk about the black struggle, we, we aren't physically, we aren't politically, socially, or culturally free. And neither are we, we continue to live into the freedom of who God has called us to be as black people. And so I just think, I just wanna change the way in which we think of the Exodus story. You know, it's about a movement toward freedom. And that's why I say in my book that God didn't choose uh, a people, God chose freedom. He chose a people as the people were pleading uh, and crying out against their oppression and crying out to be free. God chose freedom. God is on the prefer. God makes a preferential option for freedom. And I even like to say that as opposed to a preferential option for the oppressed. It is for the oppressed as they struggle toward freedom, right? And so that we don't begin to think of ourselves as these chosen people who have a manifest destiny to take over somebody's land, right? And that's, that's right. so anyway. <laughs> right, right. See, now you're saying things I don't, I don't wanna answer the previous questions that you, that you asked me because, um, <laughs> yeah, and I don't even remember what it was had to do with Buddhism and, okay. and, and, and so on. You but, okay, you come back, okay. I am uh, taking in what it is like to be a theologian. <laughs> and so I hope other people are taking that in as well. Um, for you to say that the story, the Exodus story is really about this and not about what it, it says it's about is the work of theology if people wanna know. And, um, then what is life giving, right? What is, what can I take from this and, and blow my own, you know, blow air into it to give it life and for it to be life giving for others. So, so I'm thinking about that and thinking about you, thinking about what you're doing, thinking about your work and how you're thinking about the Exodus story, which is so violent. 
um, supports genocide. And I remember, I remember as I was sitting with Exodus today, I remember Mike Pompeo mm, yeah. <laughs> and his visit uh, to the Middle East. And I can't remember exactly where he was standing, but he pointed to the West Bank area and said something like, how can you not look at this and not see in essence that it, uh, that it belongs to these people? Not the people who inhabit it, but the people who will settle on it. And um, so I think about you know, how operative this, this is still in the lives of people today. Okay, but I wanna change subjects for a moment. Oh, no, no, I won't do it. Go, go. Yeah, you know, see, I'm, and, and I do want you to change subject, but <laughs> I just, yes, the Exodus story is violent, and, but the violence doesn't begin in the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. And the violence begins the moment that a people are dehumanized, right? And so the enslavement of an Israelite people was violent, right? Uh, to, uh, and so what ha violence creates violence. And so it is as if the Israelites are trapped in, in a sense in this cycle of violence. We, ha we have to be freed from that cycle. And so the original violence isn't what takes place in Canaan. Uh, uh, it's the fact that another people think that they could sub, uh, deny another people's sacred humanity, right? And so that, so what does it mean for us to free ourselves from the web of violence that denies another person's sacredness? That mm -hmm. isn't simply mm -hmm structural and systemic violence that isn't uh, simply sort of physical violence, there's ideological violence and the way in which we take it in and the way in which we become trapped within it, emotionally, psychically, spiritually, let alone physically. And so I'm, uh, so anyway, I, I just, what we, and so when we talk about freedom, it, let, we can talk about it in terms of being freed from violence. And, and what does it mean to be freed from violence? And how are we to recognize the cycle and web of violence uh, that we are caught in? So I have no patience. You know, we, we talk about Black Lives Matter. I have no patience when people uh, talk about the violence of protesters. Really? Uh, to, no. Or when people talk about the violence, uh, like uh, the architect of the Make America Great Again vision, uh, who always want to talk about the violence of uh, the high rates of homicides, et cetera, in uh, uh, urban centers where mostly people of color reside. Well, you know, no, that's the violence that violence violence created. You know, you've created a situation of violence that nurtures death, not life. So don't be surprised when uh, death is the outcome. We have to change the realities of violence in which people are trapped, that don't produce life and don't allow them to flourish. So, you know, that to me, again, is all about the freedom <laughs> that God calls us into freeing ourselves from the complex realities of violence into which we uh, are trapped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Freedom, freedom. And I am coupling freedom with responsibility. Ah, and, and yeah. well, I'm thinking about what you talked about, uh, the freedom to be for prophetic. And I think I heard you say, and you might want to correct my um, perception here, that Black folks folks aren't really living into our freedom to be prophetic. Would you? Do you think that's true, largely, or or not? Look, I I I I. I don't think that's true, and I don't think that's true. Okay, uh, then I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you and, properly. And 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 in general, I I think that we have to lift up, say, in the Black faith tradition, that prophetic tradition. But I don't think that's true. I think because I think, and and it's 
any time that we have seen, if we're, we're going to talk about sort of uh, uh, in this black white uh, uh, in terms of racial justice, et cetera, that any time we have seen progress in this nation toward uh, this vision of what it claims it wants to be, where all people uh, uh, can live into the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and happiness. Anytime we've seen that movement uh, toward a more just society, that movement has come from the underside. That movement has come through the history of Black people struggling. It is any if this this democracy. Anytime that we have moved toward a democracy, Black people have perfected that democracy. Yeah. And, and so, and perfected it in the struggle and perfected it in their prophetic voice. And that's what Black Lives Matter is all about. And so I, yeah, I, I, I don't believe that. Do I believe that the Black faith community and that the Black church uh, sometimes betrays its prophetic voice? Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, but that's I, what I was hearing. Always been a black witness, a, a witness, a black prophetic witness, and that's why we're here. Yep. Good. Okay. We don't oh. have to have an we don't have to have an argument about that, and I'm <laughs> glad of that because we're just now forming our relationship. So um, <laughs> I want to never have we will never have an argument about that because see we're both on see we are both trying to be on the arc that bends toward yes. justice, right? Right. So it's not about an argument, it's about, because this, this is why I love our, our conversation and coming together, because it's about bringing together our different perspectives and, mm -hmm. and back and forth to commit it to the same thing and trying to figure out how to get there. Right. That's right. So I'm going to make an offer from a Buddhist perspective. Yeah. To Christians. To Christians who are, as you put it, uh, uh, paying attention to the web of violence, the web. I mean, think about the web, think about womanist, wholeness. I wanna bring in um, Ida B. Wells, <laughs> okay? Um, and I wanna ask you this question. As I've been thinking about uh, the destruction that's taken place in this country over the last few years. Um, I think that from a legal perspective, Christians, Christians could do a lot of work around strengthening Good Samaritan laws. They were crafted at a time where we were more civil. We are less civil now. And so what would it take for, and, I, and I'm coming from a Buddhist perspective around compassion. What would it take for us uh, who, are, who are on that arc to really look at these laws and advocate for strengthening them? Let me give you an example, a real case, right? So Eric Gardner, George Floyd, and many others died with witnesses. Witnesses mm -hmm. capturing the incident uh, on their cameras, pleading to police officers to stop their behavior because it was obviously going to end uh, in death or potentially end in death. And I've been thinking about what it must feel like for some people to have witnessed the, that kind of atrocity, to have tried to intervene and to carry what I, what I think is called, what I'm, what I'm calling it anyway, a traumatic moral injury. I was there, I saw it, I tried to help. The police officer who's supposed to be here to protect us is killing us. I failed, I was not able to help. What does that do to the psyche of a person? What is the injury and what is the remedy in law for that kind of injury? What if a witness who has tried to intervene 
and who has suffered this kind of injury. So I'm coming from your know, pastoral counseling, mm -hmm. pastoral psychotherapy perspective. Should they be able to bring a, a case against the state saying that I tried to be a good Samaritan, but the state wouldn't let me? What do you think? You, first, I mean, it's, so you keep asking these just like real simple questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. We will be together doing our work together for a long time it's go, because just for me to learn to answer your questions and, 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 and <laughs> uh, to, because they make me think and, and, mm. and, and here's what, let me say and, and keep, you pushing me if I don't don't uh, get to all the things, but I heard so much in what you just asked. Your questions are in themselves insight and a lesson. First, I, to talk about the legacy of moral injury and the legacy, if we will, of trauma. All right. We talk about the legacy that is slavery in many ways. Most often we are talking about that legacy of slavery in uh, terms of sort of structural systemic uh, ways and, 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 and sort of more material kind of artif artifacts, if you will. That is a legacy of slavery. We talk about that in terms of wealth gaps and all of that, yes. But in doing that, we also ignore other legacies of, and I don't, and I like to talk about the legacy of white, the white supremacist foundation of this nation. Uh, the, and slavery is a part of that foundation. It's a legacy of that. But we fail to talk about as well, the legacy that is the conceptual legacy, the, the way in which we have this collective gaze of white knowing uh, uh, and can't see beyond, uh, you know, sort of the way in which a white culture has defined what knowledge is uh, 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 in knowing. We don't talk about the conceptual legacy that has a grip on us. We don't talk about uh, the emotional legacy or the moral legacy, the moral harm. And I like to talk about that even collectively as it, it's, is our moral imaginary has been trapped in this legacy of white supremacy. So I appreciate that you talk about the moral harm. And, and for, to me, this moral harm, I, uh, as I think through, what you've uh, just offered, that we talk about it in different ways from the vantage point of those who've been harmed and those who do the harming, those who are on side of, of uh, those who are trying to stop the harm of another that look like them and the others who perpetuate the harm. And that that moral harm for the person is, uh, who is trying to stop it. In and that's, that's the story of black people, right? Uh, and, and trying to stop the harm to ourselves and to, and to our people and not being able to stop it because what we've seen that's happening in, uh, in terms of the police uh, uh, lynchings is, uh, is just another manifestation of the lynchings. And, and so we haven't been able to stop them. What does that do? What is not the moral harm in terms of not knowing right from wrong and just from unjust? Because people, people who are on the underside of injustice, we know what injustice looks like and what justice looks like. But what does it do in terms of your expectation that a people can be moral and that a people can do right, that a society 
can be moral. You know, Rhino Neva says that, well, you know, uh, uh, once you get a collective together, it's hard for society to be moral. Moral man, as he put it, in a moral society. What does that do to one's expectation? I am reminded, and, and you know, my son, for instance, who's now 28, said to me, uh, I cannot imagine a reason why I would ever call the police. Now, that is about more than simply uh, distrust of the police, but that's something about, you know, you can't expect people who are supposed to do right to do right. So I, 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 I so appreciate the profundity of your question that recognizes the legacy of moral harm. The other thing we have to recognize, you know, is that Think of those pictures, Io, of people who were witnessing lynchings. Yes. Now the that yes. The, first of all, so let's just go back to the 1960s and those those kids that were standing out there calling pe black people out of their name and all that kind of stuff. Those kids are still living, and they got kids. And the people who witnessed lynching, they they. Their kids and their kids are still living. And so we aren't talking even about some ethereal way in which these your moral compass uh, or, or lack of moral compass is transferred, but th think of that. And so, yeah, I, I, we do have to uh, address that. The other thing, and then I'll shut up and you can, because uh, I'm probably going afield. The other thing you said though, when we talked about the police and the police supposed to do right, we have to recognize this is where this country just needs to tell the truth. The police, policing in this country is functioning the way it was created to function. It's doing its job. Policing in this country emerged out of slave patrols. Policing in this country was meant to police black bodies. It is doing that. So why are we surprised? It, it, the, the system is functioning the way it was created to function. So we have to shift our understanding, right? We have to talk about not keeping people safe, because it was always keeping people safe from Black people, we are, have to talk about building safe communities. And if in safe communities are just communities, communities that are not saturated in the violence that denies people's humanity. And so, so it shifts. We don't need policing in this country. We can move toward uh, what I like to call sort of community responders and all of those kind of, we don't need to get into that. But I, but, but, yeah, so the other critique is something that Black people are crying out about, like, why y'all keep policing us? Uh, uh, the, 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 this, this force that you all call policing, it is doing what it's supposed to do, which is killing Black people. Uh, uh, and so I just think, you know, there's, so the deeper question is what, how do, what happens when a people speak a truth that will never get hurt? Mm. What harm, what's the moral harm, what's, what's the harm there? What happens to a dream deferred? What happens to a dream deferred? But what happens, I mean, Pastor, I'm, and I'm serious, this is where we talk about that freedom is about more than even being physically free from police beating you up just because you're black. Uh, uh, what, what happens? In, and what do you see pastorally? What happens in inside, right? You know, Audre Lorde, and we both like Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde said that we have to help our children not to take in that piece of the, not to get rid of that piece of the oppressor inside of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? How do you do that? Uh, it can be done. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And it's gonna, I think it's different for everyone because we are complex people uh, and it takes time. Uh, and it is, it begins with the recognition that we're all part of a system of oppressive system that 
uh, uh, feeds on uh, people believing in their inferiority. And so there's so many cultural manifestations of that. From a Buddhist perspective, we would say that that, uh, that to explore those territories should be done gently. Um, that it's likely you're also, when you would make those explorations, it's likely you're going to encounter uh, self-judgment, self-pity, self-shame, guilt, and so on. And so to just try to befriend those other aspects um, and, and be patient with yourself and to know that it's not just you, it's part of the system. And then also to employ practices to practice living into the fullness, the wholeness of yourself. Um, and that may be things like uh, uh, being in spaces where you know you're not welcome and staying or uh, confronting someone who you think is going to, uh, I don't know, attack you, but trying it anyway, so that you're not stuffing. So Audrey was also about not stuffing your voice, right? To, uh, to write it out, to speak it out. And after reflecting on uh, cancer, having cancer the first time, she's like, well, what, for what was I ever afraid? Yeah, and for why was she ever silent? Yeah, yeah. So if you all haven't read Audrey's uh, essays and poems, I highly recommend it. Bibliotherapy, that's another way. I think Audrey Lord's writings have been a savior for a lot of people. Um, and obviously has been like, I would say her writings are like scripture for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, many leaders have been inspired by her writings. So this is the work that we do in, in healing, right? Providing spaces for uh, living into our wholeness, uh, recognizing our fractured or amputated selves as one of my Dharma brothers, uh, uh, Dawa Tarjan Phillips says, our amputated self, how we have become separated from all of life, not just from each other as human beings, all of life. And then to do the long work, uh, the long-term work, lifelong work of uh, reconnecting ourselves to uh, the rest of existence. Uh, and that can also begin with believing, uh, with, with um, recognizing the delusion of our separateness. So let me ask you this then. So, you know, it, it, I think of Audre Lorde and I think of, of course, um, even James Baldwin, uh, who, it, especially in his letter to his 14 year old nephew, and he said, you know, don't believe what uh, your countrymen, white countrymen say of you. Uh, uh, that you aren't them, uh, uh, you, that, that indeed uh, their humanity is more at stake than your humanity uh, in as much as that they would oppress you. So my question is, is this, so what's, what is the uh, message <laughs> to those folk who uh, uh, are blessed with ivory grace that happen to look like white Americans. And this is this is where I wanna come back to your tale of Siddhartha, right? Because as you try to re-envision, uh, retell the story of Siddhartha, that what happens when he goes out, right? And and what if he recognizes, whoa, that, you know, there's racism and that he was protected from it. To me, that's a white story, you know, that black people ain't never been protected from racism. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Right, you know, and and the more well, we try, but we try, we do try. We we, we, we do try. We right, but we've all the, the well, yeah, and we as both the talk, say, the talk, right, right. As but we can see sometimes that people come to the shock that they are black and white America at a later date, yes. and sometimes it's, cata it's catastrophe for yes, them. I've but seen that. Yes. that's right. I we've seen it, and but I think that. You know, Baldwin's right. There comes a time in every Black person's life that they recognize the shock 
that the country for which they have uh, paid their loyalty is not loyal to them. The flag to which they have pledged their allegiance is not uh, 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 has not pledged allegiance to them. The shock of what it means to be black in America. So, you know, you come to that shock, you may come to it late. Some people are coming mm -hmm. to it late in life and they're like, whoa, you know, uh, the, why did that happen to me? Hello. Uh, but this, the story, you know, the story that you, you tell of Siddhartha to try to, again, as we all have to make our sort of religious myths, how do they, how do we uh, translate those in contemporary times. How do you translate mm -hmm. that in in the time of uh, of Black Lives Matter? This tale of Siddhartha coming to recognition of racism. To me, that's a, that's what that's that's the white people story. Mm -hmm. So, is that the what is is Siddhartha that white person uh, coming to recognition about racism in the world. Uh, and if that's the case, how does, how does, uh, the Siddhartha then empty themselves of their very whiteness in such a way that they can indeed have empathy and compassion for that, uh, that George Floyd mm -hmm. at the knee of, uh, of, of that white police officer. Uh, uh, because I declare that the mm. thing that blocks people's compassion, as you talked about, that blocks their moral awareness, particularly when it comes in relationship to black people, is this notion of anti-black. They never see black people as people. Uh, uh, so how, how does a Siddhartha, as you tell the story, get freed not to be able to live beyond whatever privileged reality he was living in mm -hmm. so that he can see those other persons that are other as, as persons and empty himself mm -hmm. of the privilege that mm -hmm. didn't allow him to see it in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm checking the time. <laughs> um, so as I was writing that article, uh, Buddhism in the Age of Black Lives Matters, I um, actually started, to, I was invited to consider writing something completely different uh, mm. based on the research that I did on Afri African descended Buddhist practitioners in the insight tradition, right? Lesbians uh, in particular. But then I started writing and this is what came out. So it had nothing to do with the research, but it had to do with my frustration uh, with white Buddhist sanghas. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, white Buddhist sanghas not being involved in uh, justice making. Uh, and so I thought, what is it? What is that? What is that about? What is that about? If we say that you know we're sitting with each other in contemplation meditation, freeing our minds, um, resolving or transforming our suffering, practicing loving kindness and compassion, uh, selflessness, you know, generosity. I mean, the, the teachings are beautiful. Uh, the practices are beautiful. So why is it that uh, largely, and I will say largely Buddhist practitioners of many racial ethnic persuasions are not on the front lines, are not seen on the front lines of justice making, what is going on here? So I said, let me look at the story. Let me go to the root. Let me go to the root of the story and see if there's something at the root of the story um, that kind of keeps us, um, where we keep ourselves protected from the fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in my, and there are many Siddhartha stories. So this particular one, to me represents um, someone who was, whose parents, uh, parental figures were really invested in him being a particular kind of person, uh, invested in keeping him on the path of inheriting their wealth or his father's wealth, keep him on the path of, you know, uh, having a harem, keep him on the path of, of uh, according to, to Buddhist lore, um, on the path of royalty and power. Mm. And so that can be, a, it can be a story for 
uh, non-white people. But really for me, it's about how our parents try to make us be somebody they want us to be and protect us. And, all, and many parents can uh, probably uh, understand this, this need to protect our children from the realities of life until we believe they are ready, right? So according to the story, Siddhartha slips out and boom, sees how life really is, goes into shock, flees into the forest for six years to do everything possible to avoid uh, being human, the frailties, uh, ex uh, experiencing the frailties of being human, realizes after six years and near, being near death that he can't do it. Proclaims the middle way, uh, middle way being uh, away from rigid rigidity towards uh, something that's more doable, <laughs> to put it in a short, shorthand. And then, um, you know, uh, practicing compassion, but God has, a, the Hindu God, Brahma has to fit, visit him first. So, and then he feels empowered to begin teaching uh, the Dharma. So I see that whiteness, because certainly there are poor people, poor white people in the United States, right? Many, many poor people who are white many working class white people in the United States. And this is a critique of, of Buddhist practitioners in the West that many are um, very well off, very well educated and have created a, a community that is not accessible to everyday folks. I wouldn't say that's true of every community but there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Mm -hmm. So is there something about whiteness and affluence in the United States that when they see this Buddhist story, they say, I can relate to that because I was also set up to be privileged uh, and to be uh, protected against um, the reality of life. So let me sit with that. That's possible. That's possible. But um, from, um, there are many Buddhist schools from a Mahayana, which is a newer form of Buddhism, relative ancient Buddhism, from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective, um, we are all interconnected, right? Thich Nhat Hanh engaged Buddhism, all interconnected. We are one interbeing, interpenetrating with all of reality. And so there's no separation, you know, conceptually going back to the words you talked, you used before conceptually, there's no separation between the rich and the poor, the black and the white, and so on and so forth. But we know in reality, right, right that um, the separations exist. So how do you go from being privileged uh, to recognizing the reality of things, to getting through the shock, to wanting to run from it and do everything to avoid it, to accepting the reality of our lives, and then getting on the front lines, if you will, supporting with your money or what have you um, for the well being of us all, all oppressed people. The only way that I know to do that is uh, through observing people in the act of com uh, courageous compassion. So, science should. Neuroscience tells us that uh, because we are uh, a species that mimics, we mimic people doing good things, we do mimic people doing uh, horrible things. When we see someone courageously engaged in an act of compassion, something says, I can do that too. So we need to do more of this. We need to, our acts of compassion need to be shared widely so that we can see who we can be. I'm working on, so my frustration has uh, resulted in um, the creation of what we're calling the um, Buddhist justice reporter mm -hmm. um, because Buddhists practitioners in the United States largely have not been uh, addressing uh, police brutality. 
And so uh, this is the work that we're doing. And I live in Chicago now, but I'm still part of the Twin Cities Buddhist communities there. We're gonna report on the George Floyd trials as a way of helping people understand how the system works with the hope that there will be some advocates who didn't have the capacity or didn't believe they had the capacity or the sophistication around constitutional literacy, let's say, um, to be advocates for change. You and I, we may not see the kind of change that we wanna see in our lifetimes, but it seems to me that our objective really is to help prepare people to do the best that they can, because we know this is gonna, police brutality is gonna be a reality for decades to come. But that's the only way, if I knew, Kelly, if I knew the answer to that question, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Well, isn't that the truth? But see, here's, here's the thing, you know, the question becomes this, what prevents people from living into their humanity? Mm -hmm. Because to live mm -hmm. into our humanity really is to live into the sacredness of who we are. So I say it this way in Christian faith tradition, my, in my tradition, you know, we, that we are all uh, created in the image of God is a fact. That we act like it, not a fact. <laughs> that we are all children of God, that's a fact. That we act like it, not a fact. What is it that separates us and prevents us from living into the best of who we were created to be? And this is where we have to begin to recognize and call out those uh, constructs of privilege that function not simply in terms of the privileged uh, way of being able to move through the world, systemically and socially and, uh, and, and do what you wanna do, but, and stand your ground in so many ways, but g the privilege really of um, th this kind of privilege that is internalized and begins to become the barrier, if you will, between you and your soul, you and the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. Now, and this is why I say, and I always say, you can't be white and Christian. And I don't, don't mean that just those people who happen to look like white Americans, but you don't have to act like them. And so you have to somehow empty yourself of this kind of privilege that separates you from being the very creature, sacred creature that you were created to be. Nothing more and nothing less. To, in the words of one theologian, Paul Tillich, I borrow his words of courage to be, you got to have the courage to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And as my younger sister likes to say, we all we, we are all just dressed up dirt and that's pretty darn good, right? So that you have to be the courage simply to be the sacred cre creature you are. The privilege of ra race privilege prevents people from doing that. So how do we, how do people empty themselves of that privilege? And, and from the Christian faith tradition, this is what to me it was all about for Jesus being on the cross. He uttered in, he entered into utter solidarity with the oppressed of his day. That's what, that's what that story of him being born in the manger is all about. So when you talk about how do we move people to a place of compassion, we do that by them, they have to work every day, emptying themselves, we call it theologic, theologically this kenosis, mm -hmm. emptying yourself of that which would separate you from your very sacred humanity. And if it does that, it separates you from the sacredness of other people's humanity. Oh, Kelly, you just said something that's so zen. <laughs> Seriously, we don't even have time to break it down because I know people want to engage. I guess they do. Um, but you said something that's so zen, which is... Uh, which has to do with, the, the, from, from a Zen perspective, it would be, the emptying would be um, studying yourself. And um, uh, through meditation and other practices, releasing the ego, right? Noticing 
the ego arising, noticing what it is clinging to, what it's craving um, through meditation and observation, releasing that so that you actually return to your, your best self, if you will, which, you know, some would say is no self, which I think is the emptying, which, I mean, we, oh, so many, so many things. And, 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 and James Baldwin says it this way. He says, you know, he, in his uh, book of essays uh, that was published posthumously, the, the price of the ticket. And his, he asked the question, what is the price of the ticket to be black and male in America? He says, and he says we got to ask a prior question. And, and, and that is the question, what, was the, what is the price of the ticket to be white in America? White people have to ask themselves, what is the price of the ticket to be white in America? And retrace the story in which, that, in which they became mm -hmm. white. And because the price of the ticket to be white in America is to lose your daggone soul and to be separated from you, your humanity. So you got to ask what the price of the ticket is and you got to trace the story of how you became there and let it go. And, and just, and again, I'm not talking about what you happen to look like. I'm talking about what you live mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. And this tale that you tell, see if Subdartha, you can live into the, this sort of dutiful ignorance of not recognizing the meaning of what it, of white privilege. You can just, you know, move through life, but and, and not do and not recognize that in the process of not recognizing that you have paid the price of the ticket of your very soul of your very humanity and i tell you i owe, that is what prevents people from living into the compassionate beings to which we were all created to be to suffer with one another suffer with one another in our common humanity but there's something about living into that race privilege of whiteness that even changes your gaze, that it doesn't even allow you to see that that person that has been blessed with ebony grace is the person. Mm -hmm. And so it is a person. And so we gotta, you know, I, you know, you gotta speak. <laughs> yes. the truth. Yeah. It, it's not something just going on uh, uh, esoterically, you gotta, I'm like Baldwin, trace the steps. He says, trace your steps in, uh, of becoming white. And if you trace them, you recognize that you lost your dag on humanity. Mm. Mm. Oh. I'm gonna check in with peace. <laughs> yeah, we got before questions. I say Before I say something else, peace, what do, you, what do we wanna do? Oh, this is, this is a wonderful conversation. Um, yeah, there are plenty of questions here if you okay. wish to engage. And okay. thank you both so much. Um, yeah, thank I feel your connection. <laughs> it is, it is, we got work to do. We got work to yeah, do. Yes. And um, yeah, so I just want to speak to um, those of you who might have questions. You can put them into the Q&A box. And if you would like to come on screen, um, you can raise your hand by going to the bottom of your screen and there should be a raise hand button. Um, and then your, your video can come on screen and you can ask your question directly if that's what you would like to do. Um, but there are some questions here already. So I'll start with okay. one. Um, it'll be maybe a, a simple question first. Um, and this is for you, Ayo. Uh, the question is what stories from Buddhist literature um, or the narratives, do you find inspiring and liberating? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying, what, my first answer is almost all of them, but I will um, mention um, the ones that are the most challenging to me um, because they are probably the most in inspiring to me. Um, and that would be the ones where uh, someone is being physically attacked, like a, a, the monks are traveling and bandits arrive and the teachings around um, even when protecting yourself, if that's what, what you need to do, even when protecting yourself, to try to remember that the person who is attacking you still has the capacity to awaken. 
And if even as you are going down, this is my interpretation, even if you're going down, like you're taking your last breath, that that last breath should not be uh, uh, with delusion about the person who's attacking you. And so I think about that. I think about, wow, you know, um, how can I transform my anger to such a degree that I can still see the wholeness of a person even when they're at their worst, even when they are, you know, about to slit my throat, if that's, how can I do that? And so that's challenging and inspiring and also reminds me of the story of Angulimala who um, uh, killed many people, was about to kill the Buddha, uh, chased after the Buddha, couldn't, couldn't catch up with the Buddha. Um, but when the Buddha caught up with Angulimala, um, the longer story is the Buddha invites Angulimala, uh, a mass murderer, to come live in the monastery amongst other monks. Um, so anyway, read that story. I don't wanna give it away. Read that story. Uh, what inspires me about the story is about, um, about forgiveness, uh, about trust, about not judging people based on their past, about the ability to see someone's goodness and their ability to um, be transformed from their um, past uh, aggressions. So those are the stories that inspire me amongst others. Thank you for that question. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm gonna ask one more written question before inviting folks on screen and it's this, it's for both of you. It says, how do you see the role of memory functioning alongside compassion and truth telling in the work of justice? Yeah. So, yeah, there's so, so many ways in which one can talk about memory. I, I want to, uh, I want to talk about it in a particular way in terms of, uh, for my own uh, faith tradition and the memory that uh, Jesus calls us to. Uh, in, in Christian faith tradition, of course, uh, the Eucharist communion uh, is at the center of uh, that tradition. And uh, in that sort of last supper scene, Jesus uh, says, do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. All right. And that word, that uh, Greek word there is uh, anamesis, anamnesis. I never pronounced it right, but anamnesis. And this is a memory of not simply recollection of the past and recollection of facts. It's bringing the past into the present. The past that Jesus is talking about, do this in remembrance of me, that is to be brought into the present, is the past that is Jesus. The past that is Jesus' ministry of trying to move toward God's more just future from the vantage point of those who are oppressed. So from my faith tradition, memory should function in such a way that we try to bring into our present those persons from our past who moved and worked and struggled to bring us toward the just future that God promises us all. That is the memory that we need to carry forward deep in our very souls, even as we carry it forward into uh, throughout our history. Now, that memory, <laughs> is often erased from our nation's story in our collective history. That's what the 1619 Project, for instance, is all about. Recovering 
the memories that this country would rather forget, right? So that one is what I think about that has to be carried forward. And that is also a critique of the faith community that would be the Christian church. We are called to recover and live into the memory that Jesus called us into. And if we do that, that's not about, you know, right belief in Jesus. That is about believing and becoming a part of the movement that was Jesus toward a more just future. So I'll just, I'll just talk about it that way. And then I want to add on just, uh, I'll, to your, I thank you for sharing those stories. And it reminded me of when you, you talked about anger and we, this will carry us into another conversation, but that Pauli, uh, Pauli Murray, that Audre Lord, God has helped us to understand that there's nothing wrong with anger. Mm -hmm. Anger is not violent, right? Anger can be liberating. Anger leads us to the truth. And we often tell the people who uh, are under the knee of the police officer, don't be angry. We often tell the people who are under the knee of the police officer with their life being squeezed out of them, forgive your, forgive your mm -hmm. oppressor. Oh, whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah. No. Hold up. <laughs> Hold up. We're, we're calling them to be compassionate to the people who have their knee on their neck. Now, I believe in forgiveness, but forgiveness is about forgi forgiveness is freeing. It's freeing oneself from the sin of the oppressor. So it's like I'm not gonna, you know, live trapped in your in in your, in your sin. And and anger is a part of that freeing process that you that you know that you have a right to be angry. Uh, to, so anyway, but that that got off of, off of that question. But I just had to because we both like Audre Lorde, and 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 I can't let the moment leave that 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 said that anger is 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 problematic. You have a right to be angry, and angry is a part of the protest, and angry is a part of the recognition that you know what you are not respecting my humanity, and that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. There, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't want to add anything to that to that question, because I think there are other other questions. All right. Thank you for that. We'll invite um, someone on screen now. Here we go. So Yaki, you can uh, feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your video and ask your question. Took me a moment to figure that oh, out. Oh, you never know. You <laughs> never know where Yaki is going to be. Ayo. Hello, Dr. Hello, good Ayo. to see you. Thank you for your example through all these years. I work with a, a group of women, mostly, who, for many reasons, find themselves facing judicial abuse. We find a lot of solidarity with organizations like the Innocence Project and have recently had conversations that show solidarity with Black Lives Matters. When you speak of these systemic issues, I'm reminded of a, a sign I'm sure you may have seen that says um, the system isn't broken. It was born, it was built this way, it was created this way. Um, and so I just wanted to affirm to both of you that what you are doing is extending far beyond just the topic of racism in Buddhism and Christianity. It's actually setting a tone for people to understand systemic abuses and the extended offshoots of this type of abuse. I'm wondering if either of you could speak to prophetic gift that is is launching out from this movement um even beyond racism yeah I, i'll just say real briefly yaki that um so after being angry 
for a, a good year, like waking up with anger, anger throughout the day, anger in the evening, peppered with rage throughout the day. Um, the, one of the things that broke, helped, two things helped break that anger. One was visiting the George Floyd Memorial, which I did not want to go to. But when I went and saw the people there and saw how he, he was honored and saw how art had been made out of um, things that had been destroyed, I began, something began to shift for me. Hope came to me when I saw uh, news reports of people across all of our differences, locked arm in arm, marching everywhere in the world against police brutality, not just against the killing and torture of George Floyd, but against police brutality where they live. And that's when I began to see a new world emerging. It's like I saw it emerging in Charlottes, Charlottesville, Virginia, but it was, the coverage was very short. But then I saw it after George Floyd was tortured and murdered. And I said, there's a new world that, um, that, I, that I wanna be a part of and I fully support how we are moving forward. Can I just say sort of amen to that? It's funny, we do have a, a, a more connections because it was, for me, wasn't anger uh, as much as despair and like, oh my gosh, you know, um, when will this end? Uh, and I went down to the Black Lives Matter protests uh, here in DC and it was in those protests uh, and all those people gathered uh, that hope emerged. Mm -hmm. The protest was the hope as long, and, and the people reflected, the, the gathering of those people reflected the world we could be. And as long as there are people that are protesting for a better way and reflecting that better way, even in the protests, there's hope. Mm -hmm. And that's what lifted me. Thank you, Yaki, for the work you're doing too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll invite another person on screen to ask their question. Let's see if technology works out for us. Wonderful. While we're doing that, I need to tell Kelly that I attended an Episcopal church for four years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> in, in Oakland, California. You know, I was in that square in Oakland, yeah. Oakland, yeah. St. Uh, Augustine's or St. Augustine's, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Gotta do my shout out. I think it's somewhat, somewhat on. Someone on, on screen wanting to ask a question, it looks like. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, maybe it was an accidental raised hand. So as we're sorting this out, I'll, I'll ask another written question. Hmm. As I have a question for Kelly, if, if, if uh, uh oh! <laughs> go for it. Go for we're it. Winding, okay, we're winding down toward the time. So I know, I know, to, but but it, hear me out. Oh, I got you. Hear me out. Do you think it's time for us Black folks in the United States to make some steps around resolving our ambivalence about this country, as as our, as our home. And the reason why I ask you that question is because um, I think of, I'm thinking about uh, First Nations people. And I'm thinking about um, our experience being in this country and how we got here and so on. And I'm thinking so much of our ambivalence about this country 
and I see ambivalence as in what we decide we're going to invest in to make this country better. Um, that so much of our understanding of, of our country, if, if we claim it as such, is based on our experience with white people, but not with First Nations people. What if we were to start engaging in dialogue uh, with First Nations people and asking them about what they think about our presence on their land? I know, okay, we've got two minutes. You see what I'm getting at? Well, here's what I think. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I, I think that uh, those of us who have been on the underside of white supremacy need to come together even more. That's First Nations people that are, uh, that is also African-Americans, black people and other black people have to come together uh, even more to uh, work together to free ourselves in this country from that and also recognize our commonality so that we are not set over and against one another, mm -hmm. first of all. And I think that what, uh, I wanna reverse that, you see, because the burden once again is placed on the people who have been on the underside of the white supremacist foot. What has to happen is this, this nation has to get over its ambivalence of who it's gonna be. <laughs> uh, uh, because this nation is, a const is in constant war with itself. On the one hand, this nation was founded on a white supremacist foundation and identity that it is a white supremacist, that, that make America great again vision emerged, that ain't no accident. It was just the genie let out of the bottle. And this will continue to happen until the nation decides who it wants to be and gets over its ambivalence between being a white supremacist nation or living into the vision that it perhaps accidentally gave birth to in the Declaration of Independence, because in that very declaration, it also, you know, sort of, uh, well, in that very Declaration of Independence, it makes claims against the sacred humanity of First Nations people, right? Right, yes. in, right in the declaration where they yep. talk about this vision. Mm, yep. So, so uh, but this, but it gave birth to this vision somehow. Uh, uh, and so the nation hasn't decided what kind of nation it wants to be. Is it gonna mm -hmm. be this white supremacist nation or is it gonna be this nation mm -hmm. that's just freedom all? So mm -hmm. African-American people, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just keep this right here, right and, here, just, yep. But mm -hmm. in, in that constitution, in that constitution is not only that black people are three fifths people, but there's a fugitive slave law uh, uh, in that constitution. So in the right. constitution. So here's the thing, when you talk about black people's ambivalence uh, in, uh, about who we're gonna be in this nation and how we're going to re uh, relate in this nation, that's, a, you know, Black people, the nation's ambivalent, and we will dis we can't we will make the decision. Uh, we we have to remain ambivalent as long as the nation uh, is ambivalent about what kind of nation it wants to be. And we have a right. There's always we have a right if we uh, to to own our pl place in this nation. We've always been the people trying to make the nation better anyway, uh, 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 oppress people. Uh, and so we have a right to make the decision of how we wanna place ourselves here or, or, or not here. Uh, uh, and so, uh, and at the same time, yes, our, our natural alliance should be with First Nation peoples and who too have found themselves uh, on the under, because 
of white supremacy that manifested itself as manifest destiny, exterminating them. The, the rule was either they assimilate or they get exterminated. That's how this nation uh, treated First Nations people. So that, that's our natural allegiance, but I wanna take the burden off of uh, First Nations folk and the burden off of uh, black folk to decide who they wanna be. The nation needs to decide who it wants to be. And then we'll decide how we're going to respond to the nation. And, oh. and what, we're, what we're doing now is trying to call the nation to its better angels. The Black Lives Matter movement, if, if, if this nation could ever get to the place where it would say black, that, uh, that affirmed that Black Lives Matter, then guess what? The nation may have gotten to the place of living into its better angels. So the Black Lives Matter movement ain't just for black people. It, we just, we keep trying to rescue the nation and trying to rescue the soul of the nation. Uh, to, but that can't happen until the nation begins to treat those people that uh, uh, are on the underside of its so-called democracy better. And as, and as much as that's the case, uh, then the nation uh, will never be the democracy that it claims to be. But First Nations folks and Black folks, we just keep trying to save the nation. Uh, uh, and so hopefully the nation will decide if it wants to be saved. But we are at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, yeah, you know, you I, look anyway. We 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 are at the end, and I think our deal was that you were going to begin, <laughs> and I was going to wrap up, and I just want to wrap up by first saying that this is the beginning of our work together. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ayo, yes. day. I mean, and it is. And I so appreciate your work, your presence, and your spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, and uh, that it is together and that we can, you know, create some kind of, of change that makes, I always say, even if it's just in our little garden of the corner of the world in which we have been blessed to inhabit, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, to create a change that is more reflective of the kind of world that will allow all people to live into the sacredness of whom they were created to be. And so, you know, I, I, I like to always sort of end with this and, and, it, and, and I uh, Take it even from your from your work and from your the, the spirit of the ways in which we're connected. You know, you've asked you asked a question earlier about compassion and how do we move people toward compassion, right? Every world religion has some version. Not that I know every world religion, but has some version of what we call in the Christian faith tradition, the golden rule, right? Mm -hmm. The do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I like to think of that in the reverse. And that is don't withhold from another that which you would not want withheld from yourself. Do you want a decent place to live? then don't withhold it from another. Do you want food, safe, clean water to drink? Then don't withhold it from another. Do you want health care? Don't withhold it from another. Do you want to be affirmed and valued as a sacred child of God? Then don't withhold it from another. I think if we can begin there, and say to ourselves, I will not withhold from another that which I would not want withheld from myself. That's the beginning of compassion. And then we move to create a world where we don't withhold from another that which we would not want withheld from ourselves. So let's work together. Mm -hmm. To Amen, do that. I and say. <laughs>
for this conversation. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yes. You, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you for this beautiful, insightful conversation. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Good night. Good night.